Hello, greetings, and welcome. Uh, let's take a look at our second example from uh, week seven. And so this one is from chapter three on goal programming. Uh, so in this screencast, we will set up our grow, uh, goal programming uh, model, and then we'll have a follow-up screencast in which we solve using LibreOffice Calc or Microsoft Excel. So here we go. So Mantle produces a toy carriage whose final assembly must include four wheels and two seats. The factory producing the parts operates three shifts a day. The following table provides the amounts produced of each part in the three shifts. Uh, so we're given data for shift one, two, and three, and the units of wheels and seats produced per run. If possible, right? So there's if possible, our key word that you know this is going to be a goal constraint. The number of wheels produced is exactly twice that of the number of seats. However, because production rates vary from shift to shift, exact balances in production may not be possible. Mantle is interested in determining the number of production runs in each shift that minimizes the imbalance in the production of parts. The capacity limitations restrict the number of runs to between 4 and 5 for shift 1, 10 and 20 for shift 2, and 3 and 5 for shift 3. Formulate the goal programming problem and solve. Okay, so the first thing we're going to have to do is identify our variables. Okay, and so looking through it, uh, and especially that second to last sentence, um, the capacity limitations, what we're going to try and solve for, what we want to try and solve for, is number of runs per shift that we should run. Right? How many runs per shift should we have with the goal of trying to produce twice as many wheels as we produce seats? Because okay. ultimately, when we assemble our final car, we're going to have four wheels and two seats. So, you know, optimally, we would want, you know, twice as many wheels as, as seats. Okay, so following that second to last sentence, I'm going to start by defining my variables. Okay. Okay. And, you know, we will ultimately add deviation variables to this list. But for now, right, our variables, so we can try and put the problem into scope, um, is we'll let x1... Okay, let me scroll down a little bit. X1, X2, and X3. Okay, so X1 will be um, number of runs in shift one. Then we'll have the number of runs in shift shift two. And finally, number of runs and shift three. Okay, so now we have our variables defined. The next thing to do is we want to read through the problem and first we're going to identify our absolute constraints and then identify our goal constraints. Okay, and when we read through the problem, so the basic idea is is that we run these three shifts and we want to determine how many runs, how many production runs we should execute per shift. Ultimately, we want to make a car that has four wheels and two seats. So our goal is to make twice as many uh, wheels as seats. Okay. And so reading through the problem, the only hard constraints I see, in addition to non-negativity, um, which we'll add last because it'll include our deviation variables, is found in the second to last sentence. Okay. So we want to start with our absolute constraints. And again, we'll add non-negativity to our absolute constraints, um, but we'll do that last because it'll include deviation variables as well. Okay, so what absolute constraints do we have? We have these capacity limitations. So we're told the number of runs uh, is, be is between four and five for shift one. Okay, so we're gonna have uh, four is less than or equal to x1 is less than or equal to five. Okay. And, you know, um, we can keep it as this when we ultimately program it up uh, in Excel. I'll write one as x1 is greater than or equal to 5, and then, oh, greater than or equal to 4, uh, and x1 is less than or equal to 5. All right, so basically x1 can be uh, 4 or 5. Um, well, I take that back. Where integer programming is the next chapter, where you can restrict it to be an integer value. 
we'll have no such restriction here. Okay, second will be for shift two, um, we can have between 10 and 20 runs. Okay, so we'll have 10 is less than or equal to x2 is less than or equal to 20. Okay, but again, as we think about um, how we'll set this up in Excel, we'll have x2 is greater than or equal to 10, and x2 is less than or equal to 20. And then for shift three, we're told we can have between three and five runs. Okay, so we'll have three is less than or equal to x3 is less than or equal to five. So x3 is greater than or equal to three, and x3 is less than or equal to five. Okay. All right, so now with all these constraints, I'm running out of space, let me add another page. Okay, so that was our absolute constraints. Okay, next we need to look at our goal constraints. Okay, so we're going to have our goals, all right? So our goal constraints. Okay, and so what is our goal? Okay, so when I read through the problem, uh, the goal that I identify is, remember we're looking for this keyword, if possible, is that we want the number of wheels produced to be exactly twice that of the number of seats. Okay, so we want, so I'm gonna write it down and then we're gonna take this in part. So we want the number of wheels to be equal to two times the number of seats. Okay, and I'm gonna do this first because now I'm gonna break it up and let's calculate how many wheels will be produced. Okay, So how we'll do that is in the table we're given each shift, we're told each shift how many wheels are produced per run. Okay, Where x1, x2, and x3 will correspond to the number of runs. So we'll have in shift 1 we'll have 500 times x1 wheels produced. Because right? there's 500 produced per run times x1 runs plus 600 times x2 plus, I believe it was 640 x3. Okay. And that's equal to 2 times, okay. now we need to do the same thing for seats. Okay. So 300 and run and shift 1. Two hundred eighty in shift two, in shift two, and in shift three we have three sixty. Okay, cool. So the first thing to do is we write down our our constraint as normal, All right? So ideally. Um, this would be satisfied. This relationship would be satisfied. Okay. But in our goal problem, okay, we're going to rewrite it. Okay, and actually, I'm going to take it in two steps. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the right hand side and I'm going to bring it over to the left hand side. Okay, just so that this equality equates to zero. Okay, and we could expand and simplify, um, but I'm not going to, only because eventually we'll solve this in Excel. Um, and when I keep the variables as they are here, um, I know that I can just reference the cells easily uh, in the table I have set up. Okay, but you could expand and simplify. Okay, then it also keeps me from um, embarrassing myself of making any uh, arithmetic errors. So we'll have to just do two times. All right, so now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to rewrite this as a goal constraint. Okay, so this is our normal constraint. Next, we're going to rewrite as goal, a goal constraint. So we want to rewrite as a goal constraint. Okay, so this one's a little different than what we've seen before because here we have an equality for our constraint rather than uh, greater than or equal to or, or less than or equal to. But it's going to be the same principle. 
we're going to take the left hand side and we're going to add to it two deviation variables. Okay, So let me write this out and then we'll talk about what those deviation variables are. Okay, and actually let me try and slide it over a little bit just so I have some space. Oh, so this one I forgot, an X3 here. Okay, so I'm going to add a plus, so we'll call this goal 1, D1 minus minus D1 positive equals 0. Okay, now the general idea is we're going to have our non-negativity constraint. So we're going to restrict that all of our variables are positive. That includes our x variables here, then also our deviation variables, these d's. So what's the significance of this? Right? So, you know, ideally, right, this equality would be exactly satisfied. Okay. So when we have these d1 variables, okay, so one's going to be, well, either both are going to be zero this relationship is exactly satisfied, or we'll expect one to be positive and the other to be zero, right? And so in the case of, if you picture D1 positive, if that's zero, so D1 negative is some positive value, okay? What that means is if I say I were to bring that over to the right-hand side, the left-hand side, right, ideally would be equal to zero, but it's going to be equal to zero minus some positive quantity, it's, it's going to be negative, okay? So D1 negative is, you know, if my goal is to hit zero, all right, so let's just say here's my target, that's going to be the amount I am below that target, all right? So ideally I want to be on my target. D1 negative is going to tell us how, um, how much we fall short by, okay? On the other side, this minus D1 positive, so that's a positive number. If I were to bring that over to the right, it's going to be a positive number. So if here's my target, okay, that's going to tell me how far above my target I am. Okay. So now where things differ as compared to greater than um, or equal to or less than or equal to, here, okay, we want to be on the target, not above or below. So in terms of the contribution to our objective function, okay, um, so if we call it say a contribution, and it's gonna be our only part of the objective function, okay, since we only have one goal, but our contribution to our objective function in this case will be to minimize, okay, and I'll call this say, you know, G1 goal one, which is equal to D1 negative minus D1 positive, All right? We're gonna include both of those terms because I wanna be right on my target. So deviation above or below, both of those I wanna try and minimize because I wanna be right on, okay? Um, and with that, all I would need to do is add my non-negativity constraint um, and we're good to go, All right? So. If, so finally, to summarize, and actually I'll, I'll stop recording when I summarize just so I don't, um, you know, bore you. So um, we only have one um, goal, right? So this will actually become our objective function, and so I'll replace G1 with Z. So we'll have our objective function subject to the constraints, okay? So here's our absolute constraints, which we laid out here. And then the only other one I would add to it is non-negativity, where non-negativity would include both my x variables and my uh, two deviation variables in this case. Okay, so I'll write that out after I start stop recording, um, so that this copy is that final copy is available to you, and then we'll go to Excel uh, and solve. Okay, hope that helps.